أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين ولئمة المعصومين عليهم السلام والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تقتل النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق وَمَنْ قُتِلَ مَظْلُومًا فَقَدْ جَعَلْنَا لِوَلِيهِ سُلْطَانًا آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we get these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and in glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. And then we send our condolences to our 12th and living Imam, Al Hujja, Ajalallahu Ta'ala, Faraj al Sharif, Salli ala Muhammad, wa ali Muhammad, and to each and every one of you as we gather on these nights to commemorate the istishhad of Aba Abdullah and the shuhada of Karbala alayhim abdalu salatu was salam. I'd like to just begin very quickly and uh, just show my appreciation and thanks for inviting me uh, to Winnipeg to give the lectures. I know some of you in this community and I look forward to getting to know all of you inshallah in this community. Uh, but most importantly, you know, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that together uh, we can become better human beings after these series of lectures, inshallah, uh, and especially grow both spiritually and intellectually, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, to begin as an introduction, you know, as it was announced, a little while ago that tonight is inshallah the first night of Muharram and with the Muharram you know there's a whole new season that comes with it um, a whole new thinking that comes with it um, automatically you know for many believers if not all believers I would think uh, the month of Muharram brings with it a sense of automatic sadness um, and automatic grief that develops in our hearts and you know this is uh, that, that burning sensation, um, I consider that to be a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, um, because it's that burning sensation that makes us drive forward to try to become better human beings. And I think as we will discuss in these series of lectures, uh, we all need to have that drive. You know, we all need to have that drive to become better human beings. It's not just about becoming better in my, my worldly life, in my studies or in my professional life, but there should be a drive, you know, there should be a motivation uh, to try to become a better human being all around for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that burning sensation is one of those gifts which allows us to do that because it's a reminder. It's a reminder that there were people who came before us who sacrificed everything for us to be successful, you know. And that's what Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam did. He sacrificed everything, you know. Um, and and it's, that, it's that sensation that we have to drive forward uh, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us as a reminder. You know, this is a very beautiful hadith 
that from our sixth Imam of Sadiq alayhi salam where he says Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad where he says once uh, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam came in the presence of the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him and his family and the Prophet took him and he sat him on his lap and then he said to whoever was around inna li qatlil Hussein hararatan fi qulubil mu'mineen la tabrudu abada it's a very beautiful hadith, one of my favorite hadith, you know, that says that indeed in the martyrdom of Hussein, there is a fire which burns in the hearts of believers that will never subside, that will never extinguish. And so that feeling that we get, you know, um, and even if you don't have it, fake it, you know, fake it, because it's a sign of a believer. It's a sign of a believer to feel this sensation for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and inshallah, um, it will be something that will come to all of us, inshallah. I've talked about Muharram quite a bit, and I'm not sure how many of my lectures you guys listen to, so I'm always afraid of repeating things, you know. Um, but Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Sorry. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. But you know, Muharram has always been very important to me, and I'm sure to you as well. It's been like a saving grace for me, to be quite honest. You know, it's, it's been an inspiration for me. Um, and I look forward to, to inspiring each other together. One of, the, one of the miracles of Muharram is that, you know, no matter which community I go to, for example, um, one of the miracles of Muharram is that there is Aza for Hussein everywhere. You know, whatever city you go to, you will find people, whether they gather in their homes or whether they gather in Husseiniyas or they gather in Masajid, there are people who always gather in the remembrance of the Imam alayhi salam. And it's amazing that everywhere that I've gone, uh, there have always been um, amazing reciters wherever I've gone. This doesn't just happen randomly. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gift upon the believers. This is what makes this process of Aza last for so long, you know, is that there's always people to inspire us. Uh, for me, why the month of Muharram is important is because it gives me and us, inshallah, um, an opportunity to rejuvenate our spirits, uh, to revive our spirits. And our spirits need reviving from time to time, right? Uh, the world that we live in, numbs us and the world that we live in uh, makes us lose focus on what is important rather than focusing on God it makes us focus on our jobs it makes us focus on our income it makes us focus on all of these other things making us forget that it's God who's the center of everything you know and and so we need a realignment you know cars need realignment uh, Internet needs to be unplugged and plugged in once in a while for it to work better. You know, we all need a recharge and the month of Muharram gives us that recharge. Um, it gives us the ability to, to revive ourselves and a lot of that has to do with the tears that we shed in Muharram. The tears that we shed have a way of removing the rust from our hearts, you know, and it's really important um, that, that we that we focus on crying, you know, I've had many discussions with other scholars, you know, and my, my personal opinion on this matter is that in the month of Muharram, um, crying and the, and the aza that we recite, the musibah that we recite is as important as the content of the lecture that is given, you know, because if we're not going to cry in Muharram, when are we going to cry? You know, if we're not going to cry for Imam al Hussein, when are we going to cry then, right? And crying is important. Crying um, has a spiritual effect. That's why we're always told to sit on the musalla and cry. And many of us don't have that ability to do so, right? But when we come here, there's a sense of comfort that I'm surrounded by other believers who will cry with me, you know? Um, so cry, focus on that, this Muharram. Cry, cry for Hussein, yeah? Um, and, and you'll see a difference in your life, right? Even if you're children, uh, you know, focus on something that'll make you cry. But as soon as that first tear comes out, 
the gum of Hussein alayhi salam will kick in and you'll be able to cry some more. So that's really important because I think it, it rejuvenates our spirits and, and realigns um, our fitra back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, another reason why Muharram is so important is because it gives us an ability to to once again pledge our allegiance to our to a living Imam al Hujja Ajalallahu Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. It's important, right? It's important to put the 12th Imam alayhi salam in a central position in our lives. Um, and we'll talk about that as these nights go on. Uh, but this is the chance, you know. Uh, when you read the Maktal, and you read what happened, especially on the night of Ashura. Uh, we know the history that on the 9th, the Mal'oon Umar ibn Sa'ad decided to attack the army of the Imam on the 9th. Uh, Taswa, they call it. Um, and Imam alayhi salam sent Abu al-Fadl Abbas alayhi salam and said, tell them to give us one more day. And tell them we're not running away, but we want one more day to pray. And so Umar goes back to his companions and they discuss and they allow the Imam alayhi salam this opportunity. Right? But then on the night of Ashura, uh, Imam alayhi salam gathers all his companions. And so we all know this, we recite this and we will recite it inshallah. Uh, and it is said he, he turns off all the, the flames in the tent. And he says the people of Kufa are after my blood, they're not after yours. And so I'm lifting my bay'ah for you. Yeah, I'm lifting my bay'ah for you. Go. And the one by one, it's so, it gives me goosebumps. Yeah, one by one, uh, they stand. Abbas first stands. Yeah, then the, the children of Banu Hashim stand. And then the children of Muslim stand. And Zuhair bin Qain stands. And then um, Habib ibn Madahir stands. And all of them, they pledge their allegiance to the Imam of that time. That's an amazing lesson, right? Karbala should remind us to pledge allegiance to the living Imam all the time. Right? We need to remind ourselves of that. Right? We need to remind that the Imam and preparing for the Imam is the focus of our lives and it should be. Right? Otherwise we're walking aimlessly in this world. Um, but I think another aspect of Karbala which is also very important um, and you got to be honest to yourself about this is that it, it allows us to see uh, where we are um, compared to those who were in Karbala. You know, we always hear that there were two sides, right? There was the Husseini side and the Yazidi side. And I think we would all love to think we're on the Husseini side, you know, because we're optimistic in that way. You know, yeah, 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 I would be there. Yeah, 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 I would, I would pledge allegiance. Well, you don't know that, right? Um, your lifestyle tells you that. Your words don't say that. Your lifestyle will point to you whether you are Husseini or not. But it's not just Husseini and Yazidi, right? There's a whole third group of people who were there. Um, the third group of people were those who did not fight the Imam, but they did not join the Imam either. Right? Like the people of Kufa who wrote these letters to the Imam, but then they decided not to join the Imam. And we gotta be honest with ourselves, right? That's another theme that we'll talk about all the time here. Um, Sometimes we kid ourselves, we, we lie to ourselves, thinking we're better than we're not, right? We gotta be honest with ourselves. We keep saying, Al-Ajal Ya Imam. We keep reciting, Allahumma kun di waliq. And we recite all of these things. But if the Imam were to come, am I ready to just drop everything and join the Imam? That's what the people of Karbala had to do. You know, that's what they had to do. Habib got a letter in his house while he was having breakfast, they say. And as he was reading his letter, his wife began to get his things ready for Habib to go. That's how quick Habib left. Yeah? But there were other people that the Imam met on the journey. Right? And they said, you know, Ya Aba Abdullah, we know who you are. We know what family you come from. But you know what? I have a business to tend to. I have a family to tend to. Uh, take my horse, they would say to them. Take my sword, take my weapons, take my, you know. And the Imam doesn't need all that, right? And so we got to ask ourselves that in my journey towards being a mu'min, which group do I fall into? And, and you know what, if I, 
if I'm honest with myself and I say that you know what you fall into the second group or na'udhu billah I fall into the third group let's say my life has just been a bunch of trials and so I have swayed from the religion if you can honestly conclude that that's where you are that's the first step towards success that's the first step towards success right because the biggest problem we have is that we can't admit that I have to become a better human being once I can admit that I have to become a better human being, that's when the journey towards improvement begins, right? So sometimes just the fact of identifying my issues is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember our teachers would always say that always pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show you your faults before others show you your faults. You know, that's deep. Right? That's deep, but that's the reality. You pray to God, Ya Allah, conceal my faults, but show them to me so that I can become better. If we attend these gatherings with the right intention, all of these things can happen for us. All of these things can happen for us. Okay? I will rejuvenate my spirit. I will pledge an allegiance to my Imam and I will determine what I need to do to improve the rest of my journey and we pray, we pray, that's my intention for what we're going to be doing here today. That these are the three goals that we're setting for ourselves and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that indeed He makes us successful. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh, Muhammad. Ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So one of the things we're also going to do is we're going to improve on that salawat, okay? Because that salawat was not so good. We need to be proud in reciting salawat. You know, salawat uh, is a badge of honor. It's a badge of honor, right? That whenever, even in Adhan, uh, I do this the first night, but I'm going to do this all the time, right? If it's not loud enough. Um, even in Adhan, when the name of the Prophet is mentioned, it is necessary that we recite salawat. So, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad. We, we can be in unison. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Doesn't that feel nice? That feels nice, right? That feels nice. It automatically brings some ronak into our gathering when we do that, right? You don't ever undervalue the salawats, right? Um, there are hadith that tell us that the weightiest act that will be placed on the Mizan on the Day of Judgment is the Salawat that we recite on Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So, in the course of these lectures, we're going to be focusing on what are our responsibility for our Imam. Okay? Um, and of course, through that, the primary responsibility that we have is reformation, to improve our lives, islah, right? And we'll talk about that in, in two lectures from now. Um, but the way we know what our responsibilities are, uh, we, have to have a, we have to have a source, right? Because you may think your responsibility is X and you may think your responsibility is Y but there are certain concrete responsibilities that all of us have for our Imam. Um, and so where do we find the answers for that? You know where we find the answers for that? In the tragedy of Karbala. Okay? When we analyze and when we study the tragedy um, of Karbala, uh, we find the blueprint of what our responsibilities are for our Imam. And that's what we're going to be discussing and trying to understand. And what I want to do the first two lectures is help us understand and realize that there is this tremendous link, right? Tremendous link that exists between our third and our twelfth Imam. A tremendous link. Um, this link is so uh, clear and it's so solid that what was one, what one is led to believe or what is clear to one who understands this link um, is that when we fulfill, when we understand the tragedy of Karbala and what the Imam salam was standing for, uh, we will know exactly what we need to do for our Imam salam. 
exactly. There will be nothing hidden anymore and it will give us that understanding. Um, so today we're going to just establish this link. We're going to give a few examples of why and how um, this link is so firm. Now there's no doubt, right? we're not saying that there is no link that appears between any of the other Aima Of course there is, right? There's a link between all of them. Um, they are all uh, the same light. They're all the same. Um, they, have, they all have the same authority over us. They are all the proofs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, however, besides that, we find that there is this special link that has been established by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the other Aima alayhimu salam between the third and the twelfth Imam. And we're just going to give three examples today and then we'll end inshallah. Um, the first example or the first link that we have um, is the verse that I read in the khutbah. The verse that I read comes from Surah Al-Isra, Surah number 17, verse number 33, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ He says, do not kill the soul. وَلَا تَقْتُلُ النَّفْسِ Do not kill the soul that Allah has made haram except with due cause, right? Meaning um, that don't harm any, all the souls have been made haram for us to kill, except if there is, for example, punishment that one has to get, right? Um, or accidentally something like that happens. But Allah says, do not kill any soul. وَمَنْ قُتِلَ مَظْلُومًا and when one is killed while they are mazloom, فَقَدْ جَعَلْنَا لِوَلِيهِ سُلْطَانًا And when one is oppressed and killed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have certainly given his wali an authority. We have given his heir an authority to seek revenge, for example, or to seek um, some type of uh, Payment, I guess you can say. The idea or whatever it is that the wali has an authority for, right? So it's a very interesting verse. Let me read it again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Do not kill the soul that Allah has made inviolable, except with due cause. وَمَنْ قُتِلَ مَظْلُومًا فَقَدْ جَعَلْنَا لِوَلِيهِ سُلْطَانًا And when one is killed wrongfully, we have certainly given his heir an authority, his wali an authority. When we look at tradition, right, we find that our fifth Imam Al-Baqir alayhi abdalu salatu wa salam He says, وَمَنْ قُتِلَ مَظْلُومًا فَقَدْ جَعَلْنَا لِوَلِيهِ سُلْطَانًا One who is killed unjustly, we have given their heir and authority. فَهُوَ قَالْ هُوَ الْحُسَيْنِ بِنْ عَلِي الَّذِي قُتِلَ مَظْلُومًا He says that this verse is talking about Hussein bin Ali. And he our third Imam Ali said, who was killed unjustly. Who was killed while he was mazloom wa nahnu awliya'uhu and we are his wali, his awliya wal qa'imu minna idha qam talaba bi sa'aril hussein alayhi salam and when the twelfth imam will come he will rise to do, bring justice to the killers of hussein alayhi salam so we see, right, that the first responsibility or the first link that is clearly established here um, is that the twelfth Imam salam will come and his task will be to seek revenge or to seek justice for those who killed Imam salam. So again, we see a very clear link as far as the responsibility of our twelfth Imam to our response to what the third Imam salam did. The second link that we see is that the day of uprising of the 12th Imam salam is said to be the day of Ashur. Right? Um, again, we come to a tradition from our 6th Imam As-Sadiq alayhi abdalu salatu wa salam salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad where he says inna al-qa'ima salawatullahi alayhi yunada bi ismihi laylata thalathin wa ishreen 
He says that there will be a call for him. Yani the 12th Imam, he will be called out, he will be announced on the 23rd night. Yani the 23rd night of Shahru Ramadan. وَيَقُومُ يَوْمَ عَشُورَ يَوْمَ قُتِلَ فِيهِ Hussein bin Ali. And he will rise and will formally come out on the day of Ashura, the day that Hussein bin Ali alayhi salam was killed. Right? So again, another very important link to show us that there exists um, a connection right, between what our 12th Imam alayhi salam did and what or will do and what our 3rd Imam alayhi salam did. And just for the sake of further clarity, the third link that we, that we can establish out of the many links that are there is that on the day of Ashura, we have been taught a certain greeting by our fifth Imam Ali, isn't it? On the day of Ashura, um, when we meet each other, we are told to greet each other by saying, Allahu jurana bi musabina bil Hussein He says, May Allah increase our reward for our grief for Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. Wa ja'alna wa iyakum min al talibina bi sa'rihi ma'awalihi al Imam al Mahdi. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, May Allah make our reward great and your reward great for the musibah and the grief that we feel for Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. And may he make us amongst those who join the 12th Imam in seeking the revenge for Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. You know, the links are amazing and we can go on. There's actually like lengthy material about this that you can read up um, on to establish this. But I think that's enough for today, right? It, it, it is sufficient for us to realize that there is a purpose as far as why we gather for these lectures. Um, we don't just gather in these lectures to commemorate um, rituals. Right? We don't just commemorate, we, just, we don't just gather here just to check a box off and say that, well, I've attended this lecture. No, we gather here to become better human beings. We gather here um, to understand the Imam alayhi salam in a deeper manner, right? So that we can fulfill our responsibilities for our 12th Imam in a deeper manner. And inshallah, tomorrow night we will further discuss this in more detail. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The month of Muharram is upon us now. And I like to begin the musibah on the first night by remembering the musibah of Sayyidah Fatima the Zahra You know there's barakat in the dhikr of Fatima. And inshallah through her barakah we will gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know when we think about the mazlumiyat of Fatima alayhi salam what stands out about her oppression is that not only was she oppressed during her life, she continues to be oppressed till today. Now, the fact that we as her lovers and we as her awliya don't even know where she is buried. The fact that Muslims don't even know where she is buried. You know, if you've ever gone for Hajj or Umrah, it, it boggles our mind that two million Muslims gather. And I wonder, do they even think, where is the daughter of the Prophet buried? Yeah. This, this lady who the Prophet said, Fatima tu bid'atum bidni. That Fatima is a part of me. Yet they do not even think of understanding or asking, where is Fatima? You know, Khutaba say, my brothers and sisters, that there was once a man who went into the dhari of Aba Abdullah and he held on to the dhari of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam and said, Ya Hussein, I need some things in my life and I want you and only you to fulfill these things for me. It is that the man came out of the dhari of Aba Abdullah and was stopped by an elderly lady with her back bent and this lady hands him something and the man he says, you just asked my son for something and I'm here today. 
It is said the man begins to cry and says, Ya Zahra, Ya Bya bint Rasulillah, we always hear that you are 18 or 21 years old, but with your back bent, it looks like you are far older. He says, Ya Sheikh, do you not know how much difficulty I went through? Do you not know how much oppression I saw in my life? My brothers and sisters, she saw how they denied the Prophet his last wishes on his deathbed. It is said, when she saw this, she came grieving to the Prophet. The Prophet looks at her and says, Ya Bunayya, Ya Fatima, Anti Madlumatun Badi, Faman Adaki Fakad Adani, Waman Dalamaki Fakad Dalamani. He says, Oh Fatima, you will be oppressed after me. But know that one who oppresses you, it is like they have oppressed me. It is said, Fatima begins to cry. said my brothers and sisters that once <coughs> when Hassan and Hussein were young they went to see the Prophet in his in his mosque he says when the Prophet saw Hassan <coughs> he came and he hugged Hassan and he kissed him on his mouth ah. <laughs> and then he saw Hussein and he hugged Hussein and he kissed him on his neck it is said Hassan and Hussein went back home. And when they went back home, little Hussein comes to his mother and says, Ya Amma, is there something wrong with my mouth? <laughs> she says, Why, my son? She says, Our grandfather kissed my brother on his lips, but he kissed me on my neck. It is said, Fatima, when she went to see the Prophet, she said, Ya Abata, you do not do anything on accident. Tell me why you kiss Hassan on his lips and why you kiss Hussein on his neck. He says, Fatima, leave it. You don't need to know. He says, Father, he says, oh my father, please tell me. Fabaka Rasulullah. He says, the Prophet began to cry and he said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Oh Fatima, he says, Hussain, know that your son Hassan will die while he is poisoned. So I kissed him in the place where the poison will go. But no, Fatima, that Hussein will have swords coming down on his neck. So I kissed him where the swords will fall. فَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّمُونَ قَلَبِي أَنْقَلِبُونَ وَالْآقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ مَا تَمَحْسَيْنَ